happy Saturday. Thank you for joining us as we close out Money Smart Week. This is actually one of my favorite weeks of the year. And actually, I think every week should be Money Smart Week because we should be learning more and more how to manage our money, how to make money. And for those of us joining, joining us for the first time this week, Money Smart Week is a program created by the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago and designed to provide financial literacy programming to all Chicagoans. We have certainly had an exciting week in the Chicago Treasurer's Office, informative discussions with some wonderful experts and leaders. And I encourage you to visit our page, chicagocitytreasurer.com to go back and look at things that we have done this week, as well as on our social media handles, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You certainly want to look back at the discussions that we've had this week. We spoke about um, the power of banking. We spoke about ways to be able to find uh, mortgage assistance, rental assistance. We spoke about building generational wealth and then also how to pay for college. But today we close out our Money Smart Week with a wonderful panel of distinguished guests on this afternoon. And the topic is virtual, well, it's virtual, but our topic is, is FinTech, which is financial technology. This may be you, new for you, it's new for a lot of people, but it is certainly a hot topic. One of my most important goals as city treasurer is to increase awareness among, amongst Chicago's young people, especially of the career possibilities in the finance industry and to help inspire them to pursue those careers. The finance industry of today is not like it was um, years ago, even when I was growing up. Today, the convergence of finance and technology is creating new opportunities for the kinds of careers that did not exist before. These crossover companies are using technology to provide financial services to consumers and businesses in ways that are more convenient, more transparent, and more accessible to everyone. A generation ago, there was no such thing as opening a brokerage account on your phone. And today, even youth can buy and sell stocks in small amounts just to practice and to become familiar with the stock market. We can use an app to split up the cost of dinner with eight friends and all pay by our phones. And at least we could do that. Well, before the pandemic, um, we were able to do that. Now we're trying to move back into going out to dinner, right, with friends and all of that. We look forward to doing that again very, very soon. But we can use these apps to help us meet our financial goals by automatically rewarding us with savings every time we meet a health or exercise goal. And behind all of this technology is a growing industry that's always looking for bright, curious talent. But before we get started, I want to make certain that all registrants and attendees of this conversation today know that this is going to be a wonderful session and we appreciate your attendance. Through our sponsor, Chicago Trading Company and designer Mike Cox of SoGo Chicago, we have created a branded FinTech Summit t-shirt available for free. You can see information on your screen as to how, where, and when to pick up your free t-shirt from The Crib, that's the name of the location, The Crib, located at 815 North Marshfield in Chicago. You can pick up your shirt starting even today until April 25th. Again, see the screen for more details and look out for an email with this information as well. And so I, this is one of the advantages for registering. If you're looking at us on Facebook Live, please make certain to register as well for these events. Go back to our Facebook page to see how you can register because you will receive an email as to how you can receive this free t-shirt. So thank you to our sponsor, again, Mike Cox of Sogo Chicago and Chicago Trading Company. Thank you so much for your help on today. Now, big thank you to our partners today, the Greenwood Project. We have a wonderful couple that is going to um, talk with us today and lead us through this discussion, as well as thank you to our partners of World Business Chicago, 
Think Chicago and the Chicago Trading Company. One of our participating panelists, Brandon Craig of Stash, and I hope I pronounced that right, I believe it's Krieg, but of Stash has also introduced an awesome opportunity for you to get your first investment started through the Stash app. So visit Stash app, Stash dot app, and use the special code FinTech Youth to get $20 when you set up your account. Yeah, it's a lot going on today, right? A lot going on today. And don't worry if you don't grab it all, we're going to email you. We'll let you know how you can get all of these coupons and discounts and access to everything that we're talking about. But again, see the screen during our five minute breaks, which is why we're going to take breaks because we'll tell you about all the benefits that you can get today. And so we're here today for our virtual FinTech Summit to discuss the important topic and uncover opportunities. I'm thrilled to invite our special guest moderators, Bavon Joseph of the Greenwood Project, as well as Elois Joseph of the Greenwood Project. Bavon came to the United States from Trinidad. After, oh my gosh, that is so exciting. From Trinidad and Tobago after high school to further his education. And he has worked at JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, UBS, Chicago Trading Company, Peak Six Investments on the trading floors of the New York Stock Exchange and so much more. I know that Elois is going to join the conversation soon, but I am going to turn it over to Bavon at this time. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. And again, I uh, appreciate you collaborating with the Greenwood Project to put this event on. So thanks again for that warm welcome. Um, super happy and excited to be here today. Um, I'm happy because as you said, the FinTech industry is bursting with opportunity for young people. We see that every day at Greenwood Project. And I'm excited that we can share some of those opportunities and inspirational leaders and words from them today as well. So the Greenwood Project introduces Black and Latinx students to careers in the financial industry and FinTech through a paid summer internship program for college kids, educational field trips, and our summer financial and FinTech Institute for high school kids here in Chicago. And we've been growing exponentially since 2016 as well. So we believe at Greenwood Project, there is no lack of talent. All we have is a lack of opportunities and exposure in our communities. So that's why events like today are so important and so critical. And again, we love to keep doing this again in the future as well. So let's get right into it. Um, we have a wonderful, diverse, accomplished panel that you'll hear from in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to introduce a personal friend of mine as well, um, and our keynote guest speaker today, Victor Jones, CEO of Doe. Victor, welcome. Uh, Victor also served on the board of the Greenwood Project and has been a great uh, advocate for us as well. So Victor, first, can you tell us uh, about Doe and also tell us um, what it does, you know, how you guys do it, and also why did you start the company Doe as well? So thank you very much, Bavon and Alois, for having me and moderating. Madam Treasurer, it's an honor to be here with you and all the panelists. I uh, am into, intimately familiar with your, pa with your paths, and I can't tell you what an honor it is to be on the panel with you as well. Bavon, yes, I certainly can tell you a little bit about Doe and what it is that we do. I'm sorry, everybody. This is what I do. I'm a fake YouTuber, so I got to bring the energy. Um, we are mobile stock option, future and fractional share trading for, you know, what we like to call savers, risk takers, and change makers. Um, you know, I have always said that my career, and I can touch on this in a little bit, was put together by a bunch of opportunities to fail. I think, I think learning how to take risk, learning how to measure risk against reward is incredibly important, whether you're talking the financial markets or whether you're talking about your individual career. And I believe at the end of the day, Bavon, that you're only a first time investor until you place your first trade. And at that point, I believe our generation, they wanna be challenged, they wanna be pushed, they want intellectual stimulus and challenges. I believe that's one of the key things that's driving content consumption today is a deeper desire to understand systems and structures in our world. And I believe that desire leads us, you know, at Doe to try to help people understand the relationships between asset classes, the relationships between psychology, all of those things and how it plays into the financial system. And we are here to, you know, help to facilitate elevated investor dialogue. Good. And I know um, 
personally, our students at Greenwood has also been a lot of them are on the on the dual platform actually, and um, they love it. They love the the way it's been kind of designed, focused on young people and education. So that's great, Victor. So now I I kind of know your personal story already, but sure. I would love everyone to hear a little bit about your path. How did you get to where you are today? You touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, just want to hear that from you as well. Yeah, sure. Um, and I saw on the paper, it was like, who is Victor Jones? And I didn't know if that was like a short question and answer or like a deeper existential question. It took me like three days to figure out how I wanted to respond. Really quickly, um, I'm a son. I'm a father, very proud father. My son's 16 months old. I'm a husband. Uh, my, my wife says I'm an okay father, but in the department of husband, I need improvement, but she's put together an action plan and we're working on that. She and I both think I have the, what it takes to turn it around. I'm a Greenwood project advocate and a risk taker at the end of the day. I want to, I'll take you back to my journey really quick. If anyone remembers what a newspaper is, it was this thing that used to get delivered to people's houses and it had the yes, yesterday's comings and goings on it. And in that newspaper, when I was um, 20 years old, there was an opportunity for registered representative trainee. Um, so I was still going to school, uh, but I figured, let me just go to this interview to basically to get interview experience. There's no way I get this, but let me get interview experience. Luckily enough, I get the second callback, I get the third callback. And they offer me the position because they, at the time, TD Ameritrade was going through this huge merger and they needed people who had customer service experience, but not financial service experience. So I say that to say this, Bavon, like they gave me a seat and an opportunity at 20 years old. I don't think they could have imagined what that meant. But to me at that time as a 20 year old who had just sat down and wrote, writ, written, excuse me, three checks three checks to myself. Uh, and I said, over time, I'm gonna be able to cash all three of these checks. And that was my first financial goal. You know, I had made something from a dream into reality by just taking an action, writing these three checks. Again, I'll explain what checks are a little bit later. <laughs> Give me a second, let me turn these lights on. My apologies. That's what happens when you get motion lights in your podcast room. My apologies. But <clears throat> my point is, um, I had been given a tremendous opportunity. And I know for a lot of young people out there, especially for people that come through the Greenwood Project, I don't think people can really fathom what a seat in this industry can ultimately mean, how it can shape somebody's direction, their path, and ultimately their communities around them. And for me, I think at the time, I, I sort of gravitated towards that idea that I was going to get to learn from people who are on this side of the wall, and that I knew somehow, some way, at some point, my goal was to try to bring that knowledge, that understanding, quote unquote, to the other side of the wall. And after, you know, 13 years at TD Ameritrade, two years ago, I had a tremendous opportunity to speak with um, a couple of people, a couple of entrepreneurs, very successful entrepreneurs in Chicago. And, you know, we sort of put together this plan to say, look, we have a face, we have an opportunity and a message to inspire a new group of people, a new type of customer, a new age, a new demographic who had never been spoken to before. For whatever reason, those participants had been looked at as unworthy participants in the financial system. And technology was now creating an opportunity to reshape that old thinking within the entire industry. And luckily, you know, the entrepreneurs we were talking to believed in that mission. They believed in our team. And it's been an amazing journey ever since in the last two and a half years. I've made every mistake a young entrepreneur can. Um, and we don't have enough time for that. But, you know, it's been an amazing journey. Yeah, you know, I think, Victor, you touched on opportunity, right? So, you know, one thing we preach at Greenwood Project is opportunity doesn't go away. It just goes to the next person. So always be ready. Always stay ready. So I think you're a prime example of that. Um, and I also see the impact that you have, you know, on our young people when you show up every summer to, to do uh, sessions and just talk to them and stuff like that. Um, so going back to Doe a little bit. So Doe is based here in Chicago. Of all places, why Chicago? Well, I, I got to give you the quick, quick and dirty. I started in Omaha. I had the opportunity to move to Chicago at 23 years old. At 28, I was given the opportunity to go out to Singapore, and I lived abroad for two years, helping to develop an international business. After that, I came back, and they asked me, where do you want to come back? You know, 
And I said, 100% at that time, I was like, I want to get back to Chicago. And the reason for that is, if I could just I'll paint a broad picture here. I grew up in Omaha, small town feel. So I like the Midwest. I love the fact that like, you speak to fellow Chicagoans and there's some, there's some empathy in that dialogue. Uh, no offense to anybody from any part of the country. I, I just love the interactions here between fellow Chicagoans. And I think the access to capital and experience, um, you know, I think it's highly underrated here. The access to capital, uh, the access to experienced entrepreneurs, the, um, so for me, it was a no brainer to come back and live here. And when we started the company, we had the opportunity to, again, reassess, where do we want to do this? And look, there's, there's a lot of, um, entrepreneurship happening on the West Coast. Um, but we thought this was a tremendous opportunity to show the world what the Midwest can do, how entrepreneurial we are here in Chicago, the talents both on the technology side, the product design side, the marketing side, everywhere to create an opportunity if, if we were successful um, that would help to, you know, kind of push Chicago, which had always been obviously a major financial center um, back on the map. So that was our goal. No, definitely. And, um, and I think since we started Greener Project in 2016, we've uh, partnered with so many new fintech companies also based here in Chicago. So we have seen that firsthand. We have about 35 young people working at fintech companies this summer alone in internships. So, um, so Victor, we're going to round this off with um, this question here. Um, something that's really near and dear to the Greenwood Project as well. But why do you think the fintech industry represents such an opportunity for today's young people and how does Doe work to provide that same uh, type of opportunity as well in outreach and the way you design your product and and reach uh, new customers as well i love financial markets because it's how, no matter how you break it down it's a competitive it's a competitive endeavor you're essentially saying that i'm going to find value where people don't find value and ultimately over time hope to be proven right i think you know, it's this great equalizer where we can communicate to each other through a screen. And I believe that for, for a very long period of time, the ideas, uh, the designs, the content, the messages have been a little bit concentrated. And there's this really exciting period. Brandon and his team and so many others have been a part of this sort of renaissance of financial services in the early 2010s. And it's creating a new world of opportunity, not just for participation, but to shape that new world with it. I was at a company that was focused on people that were approaching retirement with over $250,000 of investable assets. And now this entire industry is focused on us when we're much younger, when we're much, you know, before we make our money. Now there are companies that are helping you to try to find out how to make money instead of just waiting until you get it and then trying to attract you at that point in time. And that is a great world for consumers. It's a great world for participants and for smart young entrepreneurs. It, you know, there's a great endeavor of helping people to accomplish their real world goals. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it kind of speaks to generational wealth building, right? At a very early age with Stash and Doe and other apps and our young people, they all get a funded brokerage account, which Doe helps with at the end of the summer every year. So Victor, thank you so much, man, for your time. Um, Hopefully we'll see each other in person soon, but um, appreciate you coming here today and, and um, talking to our young people and everyone in the audience and inspiring us as well. Um, so now we're gonna take a quick five minute break. Uh, we'll be back with some amazing people from companies such as in the FinTech space as uh, First Boulevard, PayPal, Stash, Capway and AM Money. The panel will be moderated by somebody that I know pretty well. Uh, my wife, uh, co-founder of Greenwood, Elois. Um, Elois has worked in financial services for 20 plus years, and uh, we came together to start the Greenwood Project based on our own story, pretty much. She's worked on the trading floor of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, now CB CBOE Global Markets, and she's also very proud to be in her first, the first in her family to start building generational wealth as well. So our panelists will share some of their own stories, advice, and um, so stick around and we'll be right back in, in five minutes. Thanks, everybody. Very nice, Victor. Thank you. The Greenwood Project is trying to introduce Latinx and Black students into the financial and fintech career field dominated by people that don't look like us, that don't have the same backgrounds. They want to break that system and restructure it.
introduced me, minority students, to the financial industry. That's something I've never seen before being done in the community. Connecting them with the firm, giving them the mentors, giving them the resources to really just show them that there's a lot of career paths and opportunities for students like us. You build those professional skills that are needed. School has people that are motivated, but not like the Greenwood students. Everyone I just felt was so passionate, ambitious. I, I like being in this environment full of peers who want to achieve something, build something of themselves. You build a family with the Greenwood Project who really genuinely supports you. Just opens your eyes to the careers you've never heard of. Greenwood Project has done an amazing job with helping me get those opportunities so I can see which is best for me. So by the time I graduate, I know exactly where I want to be.
Welcome back, everyone. We will now kick it over to Lois. Hello, everyone. You're here at the Chicago City Treasurer's first uh, youth fintech summit. I'm Elois Joseph of the Greenwood Project and I'm excited to introduce this next panel of incredible people from some groundbreaking fintech companies. Please welcome Dan Rogers, the co-founder of AM Money. We also have Brandon Creed, CEO and co-founder of Stash, Travail Williams of PayPal, Sheena Allen, the CEO and founder of Capway, and Asya Bradley of First Boulevard. Thank you all for being here. We'll start off this panel with a round robin question for everyone. When I say your name, I'd like for you to share your path to where you are today. Tell us about what you studied, where you worked, and how you ended up here. So for starters, uh, let's go to Sheena. And Sheena, let us know about your path, please. Hi, uh, my path to starting Capway, uh, born and raised in Mississippi. I uh, went off to college and I studied, I double majored in film and psychology, but it was also where I started my first tech company in college and um, spent time in, in Silicon Valley and in Austin. And then my second startup is now Capway, which came about um, just seeing in bigger cities how we were going cashless and noticing back home, we were mainly still cash based. So cash was still king. And that actually was what led me into the FinTech space. Wow, that's awesome. Dan, same question for you. Sure, absolutely. Like um, I'm a Chicago kid through and through. And so like I grew up here, graduated from Kenwood Academy back in 2001. And for me, I started AM because of what happened next. And so I couldn't afford to go to college. Um, and instead I joined the army and use that as a way to kind of just pay the bills and start on a pathway towards college. After all of that, um, like I, I left the military transfer to a four-year college and then hit a snag in terms of how to pay for it. So in my case, I had a grandma who was able to co-sign on a 15% interest rate loan. Um, and that always kind of stuck with me. And so ultimately it kind of worked out like where I was able to graduate from college worked in the State Department for a long time, went to grad school to get my MBA in finance, worked at Deutsche Bank and Uber. And then about five years ago, I just kind of took a step back and started to think about what's a problem that I personally wanted to solve. And that question of how to pay for college was it. Thank you. And moving on, Asya, can you tell us your story, please? Happy to. Um, thank you for having me on the panel. So I'm Asia Bradley. I'm an immigrant to the United States. Um, I was actually born in South Asia. I'm one of those unregistered girl children that you hear the United Nations talk about. So when I was born, it was essentially like no plumbing, no water, no electricity kind of a structure. Um, luckily, my parents had the foresight to move us to Canada where I've been educated. So I actually did my college degree there. Um, but I worked while I was studying. You know, I didn't have parents that could pay for my college education. So I worked full time and took my classes um, whenever I could squeeze them in around my work schedule. Um, following graduation, I worked at Cisco Systems, which was in uh, Amsterdam. And so I had the opportunity to move to Europe, which was really exciting um, and got to be part of their Europe, Middle East and Africa headquarters. At a certain time, um, the philanthropy bug kind of bit me and I realized I needed to kind of travel and needed to have more of an impact on this world. Um, and so I started doing some work with um, the United Nations, with Amnesty International, did some documentary work. And it was really exciting. I just felt I needed to kind of hold on to some really impactful things and make my mark on the world. Um, before I knew it, I found myself in Africa. So I was in Egypt in the Middle East um, and you know, owned a public relations and marketing communications agency. Um, we became the sole affiliate of Burson Marsteller for Europe, uh, for Middle East, Africa, um, North Africa and Afghanistan. Worked with a lot of cool brands and then the revolution started. And so when the revolution started, I had a baby in my arms and I realized I needed to get myself somewhere safe and found myself in Chicago. And that's where it all started. 
Um, when I came to Chicago, I needed to come in as a Canadian citizen. It's not possible to just start working. You can pay taxes, but you can't make money here. Uh, and so I realized I needed to do something. And so I came in on an investor visa, started a business in Schaumburg, um, you know, owned a wellness center and, and then ended up selling that um, back to the doctors that were part of the, the partnerships. Um, and then I realized I wanted to get back into tech. And so moved out to California, um, became uh, a founding team member of Synapse Financial Technologies. And Sheena, I don't know, don't know if you remember me, but we met at, at, um, at Synapse and I'm always excited to see your progress um, and your success. Uh, so always a cheerleader for you, Sheena. Um, but, you know, got to launch hundreds of incredible fintechs um, while I was at Synapse. And I realized that there was so much power in technology and particularly in financial technologies in terms of inclusion um, and getting more people at the table. Um, and so then suddenly, you know, kind of kept on going in the fintech space um, and then George Floyd happened, right? So the murder of George Floyd happened and that really just shook my world. Um, I've got three sons of my own. Uh, and when I saw George Floyd on the pavement calling out to his mama, my mama heart, this mama brain kind of just woke up. And I was like, I can't do what I'm doing anymore. I can't just work at any old fintech. I need to solve this problem because I cannot bear the thought of my son one day being on the pavement. And so I realized that I needed to just sort of find a solution to this. I called up my good buddy, um, Donald Hawkins. He's based in Kansas. He's, um, he's also in the FinTech space, also a successful serial entrepreneur like myself. Um, and we came up with a solution, um, which was First Boulevard, uh, a neobank that is unapologetically black. We are about the culture for the culture. We are built by the culture. Our team is, um, our leadership team is 100% BIPOC. We are over half black in the company as well. We've got one fifth of our company is LGBTQ plus, one fifth of our company has disabilities self-identified, half of our company are caregivers, but we really strongly believe in representation matters. And so we've made sure that our team is diverse. And I think Bevan, as you were saying earlier, um, you know, it's not that there's a lack of talent out there. The talent is in there. If we would just stop being racist, we could build really diverse companies and as a result, build amazing products. Wow, that is a really awesome story, Asya. You know, so many companies um, are all about diversity, but the one thing they forget about, there is a key component to diversity and that's called inclusion. It's like inviting people to a party and saying, oh yeah, we've got everybody coming to this party, but yet you only play one type of music. People forget about the inclusion piece. That's really important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, going to move on to Travail. Could you please answer the same question for us? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all so much for having me. I'm a Chicagoan born and raised on the West side, uh, North Lawndale to be specific. And I wanna say what got me here is like, that background. Um, I'm from poor working class people. My mother took out a really dangerous, hefty mortgage loan and was house poor. And so I found myself like doing the free lunch program and we had like all of these different government services supporting us. Um, but I was fortunate to go to Simon's College Prep High School, become an alum, graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago where I studied English and Black Studies. Um, during college, I took a couple of internships in management consulting and nonprofit management. Um, but the most profound experience for me was um, I was a Newberry Library undergraduate research fellow where I studied slavery and medicine. And specifically, I learned about um, just the robbery that had happened to the Black community in the course of 400, 500 years. And I really wanted to understand why was that still something that was creating my present conditions. So I ended up working in wealth management at US Bank, uh, thinking that I could either figure out this large racial wealth gap problem and found myself really interested in sort of where FinTech was headed with robo advisors and all this other stuff happening. Um, from there, I moved to American Express. They had just acquired a company called a certified five years prior. And I had the opportunity to work in fraud data analytics and I wanted more. I really wanted to work in the merchant space um, because I wanted to see like 
the larger transaction life cycle um, of a dollar. And I found myself working at Braintree PayPal. And that's what I currently do. All right, great. And it sounds like we were neighbors. I grew up um, on the west side in the North Lawndale area, went to Lawndale Academy before moving to the south side where I attended Limbloom for high school. We were direct uh, school rivals with Dan over there. Hey, Dan at Kenwood. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah, so um, great to hear your story and thanks for sharing. Um, and moving on to Brandon, can you tell us about your path? Hi, everybody. And, and uh, thanks for having me today. It's, it's great to be here to, to hear all these stories and also to share uh, my story in stashes. You know, I, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do when I was younger. I ended up going to culinary school and then hated it and did a little time at college, but I couldn't afford it and my parents couldn't afford it. And so I decided in 1998 to move to New York to figure out my life. And I had a deep passion for learning in technology. And I just, again, had no idea how to place that. And what I saw when I got here was a lot of people that I was meeting were working on Wall Street. And uh, I met these two guys that get very lucky who were starting an electronic trading firm. And uh, the incredible city of Chicago treasurer said before that there was no electronic anything 20 years ago. And what it was that I saw was it was about all these big, loud, boisterous men screaming and yelling on the Wall Street stock, on the New York Stock Exchange, if you've seen old movies. And these two guys I met were quietly trading with a data center behind them. And I said, well, this is what I want to do. And we ended up totally disrupting uh, the old school way of trading and built one of the largest trading businesses in the US. And uh, that business was uh, eventually acquired. And it, we went on to trade about uh, a little bit over 25% of the US stock market volume every day and never used a phone. So it was all through computers. And I ended up doing that for a long time and left uh, and went to a big bank. And what I noticed is when I went to work at a bank to do the same thing, all of my friends started asking me about money because I worked at a bank. And they're like, hey, Brandon, what stock should I buy? Should I sell it? What do I do? And I was always a high-speed trader. So if I held the stock for a tenth of a second, that was like an eternity for me. So my co-founder of Stash, Eddie and I said, well, something's going on here. Let's go out to the street and start asking people about money. And so after 15 years, I found myself back trying to figure out how big of a problem something was. And I would walk up to strangers in the street, literally in midtown Manhattan and say, hey, do you, do you invest your money? And every single person I asked said no. And they'd always say, I, I don't invest, I'll do it later. I'll do it later when I understand it or I'll do it later when I'm rich. So we used to ask the question, okay, what's rich mean? Can you tell me that? And no one could answer the question. No one could ever put a dollar amount of money on what quote rich meant. And then when we started digging into, okay, well, what about you not doing it now for your understanding? Everyone said, I never learned about it at home from my parents and I never learned about it at school. And so when we started looking at, at this problem, we realized that it affects over 175 million people in America to be conservative who are not investing, who are not getting financial education, who are not doing anything to plan for the future, but they should. And it really came down to access and education. And you know, long story short, after 18 years on uh, Wall Street on an electronic trading desk, I quit and my co-founder Eddie and I both started Stash. And that's, uh, and now here I am today. Wow, thank you. That's an amazing story. And also those numbers, 175 million, wow. Like I knew that there was a lack of financial education, especially in certain areas, but I gives you a whole different perspective once you put a number to it. Thank you so much for sharing that information. So going over to Asya, Asya, I love the tagline for First Boulevard, unapologetic banking built for black America. Can you tell us what that means, why it's necessary, and most important, why the fintech industry makes this kind of inclusivity possible in a way that wasn't possible before? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, for, for us, it's, it's just really important. You know, one of the things I highlight often is that there are thousands of white banks out there, you know, and, and, and it, they're white banks. They are white banks out there. And so when you, when you walk in looking like me or you know, a bunch of you on the screen here, how do you all feel when you walk into a bank that is very culturally white? You do not feel welcome. 
You do not feel like you really stand a chance at getting even your own money. You know, when you hear stories, for example, on there, Jimmy Kennedy trying to open a private, you know, client account. He's an ex-footballer, a multimillionaire, you know, puts almost a million dollars into his bank account. And then he's told by a bank employee that we can't give you private client status because, well, my managers are afraid because you're a big black man. This is the reality of America. And this is the reality of black people in America. And so when you're trying to build something that essentially what we're trying to say is we're unapologetic about it. This is a culturally black bank. Everyone is welcome. You know, you can be part of it, but you got to be comfortable with that culture. And what that means is that like, you know, you don't have to worry about what you look like. You don't have to worry about your skin color. You don't have to worry about how you speak. You don't have to switch out of your vernacular to suddenly start sounding a little bit more acceptable to the norm or whatever that means. But you can just be yourself, come in and have access to financial services, which in our opinion is a right. Did you know that by 2053, the median income for black families in the US is going to drop to zero dollars? Zero. And it's only accelerated because of what's going on with the pandemic. So in fact, it's actually, I guess it's gonna be even sooner than 2053. So that's really going to happen. Um, the other thing that we wanna take you know, into consideration is that we've got a one and a half trillion dollars of economic impact in the black community. Add to that the one trillion that is in there for the Asian community, one and a half trillion of the Latinx community. So you're looking at like $4 trillion of annual economic impact that the black and brown communities have, the BIPOC communities have in the US. But how much of that actually translates to ownership in this country, right? Very little. So you're looking at, you know, and, and I know Brandon, you probably know about this, only about 2.4% of the country's equity market wealth is held in the portfolios of black and Latinx degree holding households. For black, it's less than 1.6%. That's crazy, right? It's crazy. So I think, you know, platforms like what Brandon is building, what Sheena is building, you know, what we're building, um, even PayPal has opened up a lot for us, you know, what AM Money is building. It's just increasing the inclusivity. Right now, if you walk into a bank in a predominantly Black neighborhood, your minimum balance requirement is going to be about $240 higher than if you walk into a bank in a predominantly white neighborhood. That's allowed, folks that's legally allowed today. And there are a lot of excuses for why they've done that, right? But these are the kind of things that we're combating when we set up accounts and say, doesn't matter which zip code you live in, you're all going to have the same access to financial services. Doesn't matter what color your skin is, you're all going to have access to really great financial education, not financial literacy, because our people are not illiterate. There's just a lot of education that has not been made available to our communities. And that's really part of the goal of what we're building. Well, thank you, Asha. You know, I think about um, a lot of things I see on social media or just people, different conversations that I may overhear. And they ask, you know, why are black people or people of color so angry about, you know, when we have access to everything? And it's like, honestly, we don't. If you look at the fabric of America and the systems, the systems that are in place to keep certain people down and the fact that they still exist today in 2021, it's very problematic. And I'm angry and every American, every American should be angry. So thank you for doing what you're doing in this space to try to change it. Totally appreciate that. Dan, I'd love to hear more about the mission of AM Money and how it works. I know well from my work with students that talent and smarts are rarely a barrier. It's opportunity that's the barrier. One of those opportunities is the opportunity to pay for school, right? Can you speak to young people who are watching and tell them what they can do if they have the grades, they have the drive, but they don't have the money, whether they're still in high school or they're struggling to pay for college tuition right now? Sure, absolutely. And so um, I would say like the first thing and the most important thing is to just keep going and to find a way and then ultimately to not be ashamed of what you have to do and the pathway that you have to walk to get to a certain place, right? Like in my case, 
I talked about how, you know, I joined the army um, to kind of like help put me on the path towards college. And I was on active duty for four and a half years. And while I was on active duty, um, I actually completed my first two years of college. And it started out like with a couple of night courses here and there. And then ultimately I went overseas um, as a recon team leader. And even while I was there, completed six courses online. Um, and, and so basically how that would work was I would read a textbook, go out on a mission, come back and have to write a paper, right? After all of that, I got out and transferred to a four-year institution and, uh, you know, after one semester basically got told, unless I can come up with an extra $16,000, I'd have to drop out of college. And so in, like, like, like in my case, I had to beg my grandma to co-sign on a 15% interest rate loan just to be able to kind of get through. And for us at AM and what we're trying to do um, is really build that company that really just kind of understands what people have to do to get from the point or, or, or like from point A to point B and values that experience, right? Because for me, like I remember at that moment in time after I applied to every single possible loan I could and being told no of having this very, very strong internal sense that if these people would just talk to me for five minutes, these people would understand that ultimately, you know, I was capable of doing well. I had the drive to do well. And, you know, I had to internalize the fact that that did not really matter at all to them, right? But I also had to have the presence of mind just to keep going and to find a way regardless. And so like ultimately, you know, our aim in our company is to make that pathway that much easier to make sure that people have the access and opportunities to kind of, you know, continue to pay for school and not have to worry about paying back a 15% interest rate loan. But ultimately, that's just a story. And like, you know, certainly people who come from certain places and look a certain way, like might have to walk a different path, but that's fine too, because ultimately, you know, all things end up, uh, you know, counting in some form or fashion, right? Because I would not have had the opportunity to build AM unless I had walked that path. And it's important, like, regardless of anything else that is outside of your control, to control what you can control. And ultimately what that always means is to keep going. Absolutely, thank you for that. And also let me take a moment to say thank you for your service. And your comment about taking different, about paths, everyone has a different path. The end goal usually is all the same for you to be successful. Um, and like you said, no one should be ashamed of what they, the path that they had to take to get to a certain place, as long as they have the drive, the motivation and keep their eyes on the prize. Thank you. All right, I wanna jump in to remind everyone that you can start putting your questions in the, um, in the chat for our next segment, we'll, which we will um, respond to all the questions and try to answer them. Maybe not all, but definitely a great deal of them. So you can start putting your questions in the chat now. My next question is for Trevill. You're a coder and you've said that good code is written with empathy. That sounds to me like you feel that technology in general and FinTech in particular has the potential to create greater inclusivity in the financial services industry. Can you talk about that for us? Yeah, absolutely. And I love this question. Um, I fundamentally believe that you care about things you value and coding or software engineering or product management, whatever you want to call it, is a powerful skill. Um, it, it can come in a variety of ways and through a variety of methods, but ultimately you're solving a problem vis-a-vis -vis code. And if the empathy isn't there, then you aren't solving the right problem for the right person. And we see this all the time. There are a bunch of products we use that annoy us and we probably want to sort of email in or reach out to their support and say this isn't working and I think that's just one end of the code of sort of the issue that we're dealing with in fintech um I do want to like raise light that there is a racial divide in fintech when it comes to empathy you will find that certain groups 
um, specifically Black people, would use certain apps over others. And that simply isn't because um, these apps are horrible apps. It's just that they weren't built with Black people or the behaviors that uh, Black people have in the larger fintech ecosystem. Um, the quickest example I can think of is the rate at which Black people need to use money or even working and poor class people need to use money without in quite, like incurring any kind of fees. If they go to a regular bank, um, they may get a bunch of either like overdraft fees or fees to just send money to another person. So you'll find that in the larger FinTech ecosystem there, there's a racial divide going on, but I'm excited about the things everybody is talking about um, and what everybody is working on, because I think if we can do empathy at scale, we began to do sort of this thing where people who are not seen as valuable or even considered in building these apps will begin building around them. And in doing so, we began to create a financial ecosystem that we can all participate in. And when I say that, I don't mean simply like investing or saving your money. I mean, everything from the kind of way we look at fraud services. How do we decide who's a good actor and bad actor? How do we decide where we put equity and cash uh, in certain places? Or who do we give a mortgage out to? Or what, what do we even consider for mortgages? So I think empathy allows us to reshape and rethink all of those things. And, and if someone has the ability to code, they should always be positioning the human element. And I would even extend that to say, put positioning vulnerable or people who are not even considered in the world to be the center of solving that problem. Wow, you know, thinking about empathy and in the financial sector and also like what you said with certain people, certain classes not even being considered when a lot of apps are made. I think about some of my family, friends, close people to me who have no access to cash um, and everything that they do is at a neighborhood currency exchange or it's either at one of these um, payday loan places, right? And when I look at my friends who go cash their checks at a, at a, at a, a currency exchange, I say, oh my God, you're paying so much money to cash your check and to get your money. And it never dawned on me that there's so many companies who are creating apps and services, but are not, they haven't, they are not being inclusive of that low income person who needs every penny, but yet is spending it out the currency exchange in these predatory payday loan places. Wow. Thank you, Travail. Wow. All right, moving on to Brandon. A similar question for you. You found a stash which makes investing more accessible to millions of Americans. Can you talk about how this ability to make finance more accessible connects with making careers in fintech more accessible and inclusive? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I, it, the first thing that comes to mind is is the importance of everyone on this panel today. I mean, there is so much disruption happening right now. If you think back for the last, I don't know, 50, 100 years, a few big incumbent banks controlled most of the consumer experience in the US, at least from the consumer banking side. And so now companies like Capway and, and PayPal and First Boulevard, all, every, every company on here is approaching this problem and solving this problem with the goal of making it better for the consumer. And I think that's just so important and so powerful because when you step back and look at how big this business, this industry is, it's massive. It's trillions and trillions of dollars uh, of market cap that's been created that's now being disrupted away from the incumbent banks who, quite frankly, in most cases, don't know how to deal with it because there's so much ingrained. Uh, sorry, there's, I won't, I, I'm too New York and sometimes I curse. So there's too much nonsense in, in, and just really bad behavior that now needs to get undone by FinTech. And FinTech is doing that and it's really cool, at least that I get to play a role in that. And I think that's important. When I think about accessibility, I mean, when it comes to uh, FinTech, the first thing that all of us and, and the industry needs to do is make uh, it approachable. The gateways, there's been so much gatekeeping that's been happening, not just from the consumer experience, but also to get jobs, right? You know, I grew up again, like, you know, I'm very honest, you know, Wall Street for me when I was younger, if you wanted an internship, that's why I love Greenwood. It normally came where I got with top, I got topped on the shoulder going, 
you know, my friend's son from the golf club wants an internship and you're going to give it to him. Total nonsense. And, you know, but that's what it was. And I see that changing now. And that's one of the reasons that I love Greenwood so much is that we're getting internships for so many people that unfortunately were gatekeeped out of it in the past. But when it comes to uh, accessibility, especially as careers in FinTech, careers in FinTech are more than just software. Careers in FinTech is writing. It's visual design, creative design, customer service, compliance, legal. Uh, I'm sure everyone else on this call could keep going on with all the different jobs that we're all hiring for now. There are so many different career paths in financial technology. <clears throat> Sometimes when I, when I say this, people go, but I don't write software. And that's perfectly fine, right? And I think what we're seeing is two things. One, with people gaining knowledge and using all these different apps, they're saying, well, hold on a second. I could actually invest now. I can save now. I can get a better mortgage. I can get a student loan and understand what I'm doing through education. But I could also now approach these problems where I could work at these companies at the same time. So I think, you know, uh, I think it was Daniel just said it, like if you have your mind set on something and you need to go for it, but there's so many different roles now in these in the ecosystem of financial services that are now accessible to so many people. So I agree with Daniel, just if it's something that you really want, go for it. But you can do anything now. I mean, we're hiring, we have, we have like 75 open jobs right now at Stash. I would love it to plug if you're interested. Go to stash.com and take a look and apply. And there's a lot more than just engineering jobs. So there's a lot, there's a lot of accessibility now happening. And um, you know. There's just a lot, it's a lot more than engineering. Thank you, Brandon, for opening your door. Something that you said is something that I'm all too familiar with, and that is internships within the financial industry, Wall Street, being a privilege, right? Coming from the west side of Chicago, there was no one who was gonna tap my mother on the shoulder on the golf course and say, hey, you know, we've got this amazing internship for you, Lois, to check out when she's in high school or when she's in college. That just doesn't happen. And this is why there is such a lack of um, inclusion and participation within the financial services industry. And now Greenwood is definitely bridging that gap and being that broker to make sure that our students and, and kids everywhere know that there, to, there is a place for you within this industry. So thank you for opening the door and everyone check out Stash, 75 available jobs. That's amazing. Thank you for being inclusive. And last but not least, we have Sheena. Sheena, I noticed that Capway isn't just about banking, but it's also really about financial education. Can you talk about why that aspect of FinTech is so important when it comes to inclusivity? Yeah, so um, when I started Capway, the, the idea was definitely around like neobanking, uh, but we, we quickly kind of got to the point of like, this is more than, as you said, this is more than just banking. And financial education was a big piece of that. And it's not, it's not just a financial education of like, let me define, you know, what X is. It was like, how do we have conversations? How do we talk about the things that we didn't know, didn't have access or the opportunity to know? So we kind of look at that and break it down, I would say in three different ways. So of course we have your financial education, whereas we said Capway, it's not about trying to shove information down your throat. It's more of our goal is to give information so that people who didn't have access can kind of step back. And when they used to, used to say, if only I knew, we want to make sure now they know they have access to the information. But this is in no way like I'm trying to shove information down your throat that you should have known this because we all know the reality of why a lot of us didn't know. Um, we didn't grow up with that information. It wasn't, you know, my mom did, didn't know this or I didn't know this, it's, it's generational. But on the other hand of that, in the same sense of financial education, it was also part of the banking where it was, we didn't want to make it where one didn't go one with the other. So it was, I didn't want to give people access to money, but then they didn't have information. So as we all see the, the, you know, the news about the NBA player who gets all the money and then they blow it. It's like, if you get a lot of money and no one ever educated you about money, what do you expect? And it's also the same way. I don't want to educate you about all this money, but then I'm not giving you access or opportunity to even make money or, or gain generational wealth. So it's like, I'm giving you all this information for what? So for us, it was it, they had to go hand in hand. So that was one aspect. The second aspect of that financial education actually came down to conversations. And so we do a lot within Cafe where it's just, let's have uncomfortable conversations. 
because this is this is what needs to be taking place. And so we're just having conversations about black tax because here's someone who is finally making six figures out of their family. And yet that six figures is taking care of five people. Um, and we literally talked about that. And I just remember so many people saying, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person, you know, having to pay my mom's bill and living paycheck to paycheck, not because I don't make enough money, but because I have to take care of four other people, five other people, because I'm the one who made it. So it's the conversations. And then the last piece of that, that third piece, really comes down to storytelling. And it's not just storytelling for our users, but it's actually storytelling for people who look